Well, it is nine o'clock and let's kick off this month's aftermath. Thanks for those that have joined this morning. Uh, we'll dig right in. We've had uh, a couple or several reports in the last uh, two weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, we had the March 1 grain stocks report. We had the planning intentions report. Then yesterday, we had CONAB's Brazilian government report. We had USDA out. So we've had a lot of numbers to dissect over the last uh, uh, couple of weeks. And on top of that, we've got uh, the, the war situation in the Middle East. We've got inflation numbers that have been higher than expected. So a lot of volatility coming back into the markets here. Uh, over the last uh, few weeks. So what's going on right now in the marketplace? Well, inflation certainly has been, uh, I think, one of the prominent factors in a lot of our markets. Uh, we'll look at some of the impact of that. Uh, the Middle East war I just mentioned, I think that's having an impact on markets this morning. We've got oil up over $2 a barrel as we're recording this. So things are, are running here ahead of the weekend. We had the U.S. stocks numbers, the U.S. prospective plantings numbers, South American crops still going. We've got uh, about 80% of the harvest now completed in Brazil on soybeans. Uh, the second crop of corn has been planted. It's up and going. So it's a pretty important time still down there. And then, of course, you've got the hedge funds doing their, uh, their dance like they've been doing over the last uh, several months. But uh, first off, let's look at the stocks report. Now, this was a uh, commercial uh, or farmer ownership and commercial storage. So uh, chart doesn't show what's owned on the farm. I was looking for that chart. And I couldn't find one this morning. But what's notable on here is corn, soybeans, wheat that was in commercial storage owned by farmers as of March 1, highest we've been in several years. On-farm grain stocks were up 25% from last year. So we've got a lot of farm-owned grain right now out in the countryside. And uh, we'll talk about the funds here in a minute, but the funds are very, very short. The U.S. farmers very, very long right now. And in fact, longer than the funds are short. And that's still the tug of war that these markets are going to have to deal with here uh, as we go forward. Uh, the acreage numbers from that report on the, uh, at the end of March uh, the biggest story out of that report was that total planted acres of corn were down 6.3, or not corn, total planted acres period of all crops down 6.3 million from last year. The question we all have, and we don't have an answer is where do the acres go? Uh, are they going to go to pasture land? Are they going to go to uh, not many went to CRP? Are they going out of production? What, what's happening? Are we going to have more prevented plant this year, which is a possibility. Certainly last year was a low year. But to me, that's one of the biggest questions. You can see on this great map that, uh, uh, that the uh, uh, Senate, I believe, or the House of uh, uh, committee, uh, ag committee put together shows this uh, where the acres are at. The red states are the ones with the biggest drops in total planted acres, and the southern plains certainly uh, the biggest part of that. So when you look at principal crops planted, again, this is a very similar looking map, just uh, slightly different. When you look at by crop, I'll take you through those, and USDA puts out these great maps, and corn acres expected to be down. I don't think that's a surprise to anyone. Uh, about 5% from last year, or 3.5 million acres or so. Uh, you can see which states, just about every state expected to plant less corn. At least that was the intentions as of March 1st. Soybean acres expected to rally because of the drop in corn this year. I don't think that's a surprise. I think most people expected that we would see uh, more beans, less corn, but maybe the USDA was predicting a little bit bigger shift than what we thought. Cotton acres expected to rise. Now we'll see if that does happen. We're seeing markets back down again, but going into this report, certainly expectations with the market rallying were for more cotton acres in the United States. Winter wheat plantings last fall were down in just about every state. And so that uh, you throw a few more of those acres in the mix, what would they go to this year? I think that's a big question. And maybe that's where some of the acres in the Southern Plains went, uh, just less winter wheat and, and, uh, and just left them alone. Spring wheat acres, expected to see a mixed bag in the upper Midwest, uh, a few more acres in Minnesota and South Dakota here this year. So if you look at overall by crop, you can see this uh, shows some of the smaller crops as well, the gains and the losers. 
Uh, Durham wheat, now these are percentage changes, but Durham up 21%, chickpeas, edible beans, uh, kind of goes in line with what I heard in the upper Midwest this year, uh, especially in North Dakota, that uh, we were going to look to plant more small grains, maybe less corn. Uh, you can see as you go down the, the chart, corn down about 5% and some of the other percentage drops. Again, these are not acre drops, but these are percentage drops. I uh, do have a question, Rich, uh, that farmer grain stored corn and bean commercially tracks dead on with the percentage in our in our co-op. So, yep, there you go. So that seems to be the uh, the talk around the country this year. And it, it's going to be a tug of war here, I think, uh, uh, you know, between the farmer and the funds as we go forward. So the other thing I want to talk about is the heat check. And, and this was a, a, a thinking cap webinar I did just a few days back. I wanted to explain what this was. And, and these are the hot and the not markets. That's how I describe them. And a, and a couple of years back, I started adding this column to my market report letter every day. And over here on the left-hand side, it shows you which markets are hot, and which ones are not. Very simply, uh, we're looking at a lot of the technical indicators. The relative strength index is this first number. The stochastics numbers, the shorter and longer term stochastics, those are the next two numbers. Uh, we'll look at moving average lines. Are they trending up? Are they trending down? Did we cross one? Are we having trouble crossing one? Those are all of the things that we look at to indicate a hot and not market. And typically the RSI has to be above 60. Stochastics have to be above 70 to call that a hot market. On the downside, the not markets, usually the, the RSI below 40, uh, the stochastics below 30 would indicate to me a not market. And so our cold market, if you want to call it that, you can see last night, we've got a lot right now on the extremes. We've got several hot markets, the precious metals markets, oil. And we mentioned this morning, those are trending higher. Uh, in the not category, the cotton market, which has been sagging with the stock market lately. Uh, the cattle market has been selling off soybeans. So we'll talk about a lot of that here as we go forward. But I've laid out a lot of charts here of the hots and the knots. One of the hot uh, charts, which is not a market, but credit card debt uh, in the United States. I saw that this week. Credit card debt right now at a record high. And you compare that to the savings rate in the United States, it's not trending in a good direction. Auto insurance, uh, we talked about uh, inflation numbers came out this week, the CPI. And one of the biggest parts of that was auto insurance, 22% up from a year ago. Uh, certainly in the hot zone, if you want to call it that right now. And it's hard to see a trend, uh, that trend changing anytime in the near future. Cocoa, we've talked about this last month. Cocoa continuing to trend at record highs. Uh, cocoa bean production way down right now. And so again, if, you, if, you, if you're if you a chocolate uh, lover, you might want to have an inventory build up in case this market continues to trend higher. Gold, um, and I've talked about gold and mentioned it in my market report, but gold is trading at a record high again this morning. Uh, partly inflationary, partly uh, I think due to this talk about war, uh, but you're seeing a bunch of money into the gold market right now as a safe haven. And so gold rallying above $2,400 an ounce, silver going along with it. Now, the silver market, not historic, not as high historically. And I took this uh, long, long-term chart, monthly chart, to be able to show you other times in history that the silver market has popped. But uh, certainly the highest we've been uh, in three years. And then you go back to 2011, you go back to two, or 1980, the last times that we had spikes in the silver market. Copper is also running strong right now as well. The US dollar with a new high this morning, you can see what it's done this week. This is a daily chart. And this week we've gone from 103 and a half or so to 105 and a half, almost 106 points in the dollar. Now, this is not a good thing for us in agriculture. The, the strong dollar is not uh, does not uh, help export business at all. And so we'll see what the impacts are as we go forward. But moves like we're seeing today, like we saw two days ago, certainly are not very beneficial to the to the ag markets. The hog market, you know, hogs, you go back several months back when uh, cattle were strong, hogs were struggling. Now, all of a sudden, and I think this is driven kind of by demand, but you're seeing the hog market really running strong. 
And, uh, and even though it's settled back the last couple of days, this nine day moving average, the red line has held. And I think that that's given us a little bit of a boost in the hog market here this morning. Uh, the not markets are not charts. Here's the price, average price of a used Tesla. Uh, the lowest it's ever been right now. Apparently we have been inundated with electric cars. We have a lot more electric cars than we do demand at the moment. Uh, you can you can read stories about several companies getting out of the electric car market even. And uh, Tesla is certainly one of the biggest, play if not, well, they are the biggest player in the electric car market. And we're seeing an oversupply right now compared to what we've got uh, as far as demand goes. Uh, I mentioned hogs a minute ago, and I think now is a good time for livestock risk protection uh, in hogs. I know we've talked about this in cattle, and now is probably not the time I would want to be buying it. Uh, LRP basically is a put option. It's a subsidized put option from the government. It's a crop insurance tool, but it's for livestock. And so anybody that's been buying LRP coverage in cattle in February and March, and we've talked about this in previous uh, aftermaths, you know, those, those look pretty good right now considering what the market has done. So now, again, the RSI at 34 uh, stochastics in 10, 13 range. This market probably oversold. I've definitely got it in the not zone at the moment. I don't want to be a hedger right now. Uh, I'd rather wait for a, a sunnier day. And the same with May feeder cattle, same similar looking chart. You know, you've got your indicators down here, at really, really low numbers. It's very, very oversold. So now's not the time I want to be buying. But if you bought LRP coverage on the way up or in the last couple of months when we were at our highs, certainly you feel pretty good about that coverage that you bought. This is a time I would be looking at it if I'm a hog feeder. And so take a look at that, give your NAU country agent a call. So overall, what's going on in ag as far as the funds go? Well, we've got a lot of markets that the funds are long right now. Uh, we've got several markets that the funds are short, but you can see net net overall, these hedge funds are short still almost 500,000 contracts in the ag sector. This sector includes corn, wheat, soybeans, all the, uh, the oil seed products, cattle, hogs, cotton, sugar, coffee, and cocoa, all included in here. So you've got markets like cocoa where funds are long and, and the cattle market and the hog market where they're long. On the flip side, you've got corn, soybeans, the funds are very, very short, but all that blends in to make up this net position. And you can see still, you know, the change that we've had over the last two years when the funds were very, very long ag commodities two years ago, and now they're very, very, very short. And so the question going forward, what are the funds going to do? Are they going to start to cover? They have a little bit. Uh, you can see reasons why peak trading put this chart together. They've got the, the bearish factors in red and the bullish factors in green. Uh, certainly, you know, crude oil, I think, is one of the bullish factors that's maybe helping pull commodities, the other commodity markets along with it. Livestock did that for a while. And so we'll see what happens as we go forward. But they also do a nice job here of showing kind of what I did, the, the overbought and oversold markets and the markets that are certainly peaking right now, gold, silver, coffee, you know, those are the hot markets or the, the hog market. Uh, the not markets, you know, you go down here into the green soybean meal is the weakest link at the moment, but the wheat markets, soybeans, et cetera. So this is an interesting chart. Uh, Peak Trading puts this out on Twitter once, uh, once a week, I believe. So check that out if you get a chance. So let's start out looking at soybeans this month. Uh, soybeans have been the biggest mover. Um, the, the reason soybeans are you know, I think that way now is that we have such a huge South American crop. And so you're talking, you're never out of a weather cycle in soybeans. And I think that's what makes beans un a unique market right now. You know, we're always trading weather in beans, whether it's United States weather, whether it's South American weather, uh, you're trading demand, you're trading vessels loading. You know, there's so much going on throughout the year in soybeans. We've really taken that cycle out of the bean market, so to speak. Now, this report yesterday uh, from USDA, they made two small change, well, three small changes. Uh, they lowered the import number, 5 million bushels, made a tweak to the residual, lowered exports, uh, 20 million bushels. So ending stocks ended up 
uh, 25 million bushels higher to 340 million bushels. Uh, not friendly to the market, and beans were down yesterday. Uh, but this number has continued to creep higher. We were down in the low twos just three or four months ago. And now, because of cuts in demand, because of a higher production number, we've seen that ending stock number go up and up and up. 8.3% uh, stocks to usage, of course, the highest we've been in four years. Uh, so this market's starting to grow. USDA lowered the average farm price a dime in yesterday's report. We look at weekly export inspections. You know, it's just been a ho-hum year. Nothing stands out other than we've had maybe a couple of weeks of strong loadings. But again, this is the time of year we typically see bean loadings start to drop. We see the ship loadings go to South America. And so if you go back and look at the export number, 1.7 billion bushels, you know, the, we, we've come half over half a billion bushels off the high three years ago, kind of back to where we were middling around in 18, 19, early 2020, when we had big stocks and we were trying to figure out how to grow demand. We did for two or three years and now demand is kind of settling back down. So we kind of knew this, we've talked about this all winter long. Great uh, chart here from Susan Stroud showing the growth and the crush demand compared to the drop in export demand. We know this is gonna continue to trend in this direction as we go forward. Uh, that crush number, 2.3 billion bushels this year, a record high. We're anticipating that to continue to grow as we go forward. Uh, but it's going to have to grow quickly to make up for the drop that we've seen in the export numbers. And so if you combine all of this, you know, into total demand, demand has been still struggling, despite the fact that we've got these new crushing facilities coming on board. And we're seeing a lot of that demand go to South America. And again, Susan put this chart together showing the divergence of U.S. demand going down compared to Brazilian demand continuing to grow. And that's as Brazil continues to ramp up its infrastructure. China continues to prefer to buy Brazilian beans. And so, but we're seeing that spread right now at a record large amount. Now, yesterday we had not only USDA's report, but we had CONAB's report as well. Both uh, groups decided to, you know, what they thought the Brazilian crops were going to look like. You can see on the left, we've got USDA's numbers. If you look at beans in particular in Brazil, 155 million metric tons. That's the highest number I think that's being thrown around the trade. Uh, that number was more than 3 million higher than what the trade expected to see. And if you look at the difference right now, Conab's number yesterday was down about 146.5 million tons. So there's an eight and a half million ton gap between USDA and Conab right now. And I tend to lean, I guess, towards Conab, but I don't know that I trust their government number either. Uh, but on the other hand, USDA, how accurate can they be, you know, when we're uh, a 12 hour flight away from Brazil? So, uh, you know, I'm not sure who's more accurate. I tend to probably lump all of the, the analyst numbers together and take a midpoint. And right now that midpoint's probably below 150 million tons, probably in the 147, 148, something like that million metric ton range. I would probably lean towards that kind of a number right here. Uh, by the way, I did have a couple of questions. Rustin said, uh, USDA showing 23, 24 bean price at 1255. Do they think that many beans were sold that high or higher, or are they expecting a bump? I think that they must assume that a lot of beans were sold higher. Uh, more than 50% of the crop has typically sold October through January. So I, I know that that's got to be part of the reason for that. Uh, the question is, is that number going to continue to come down? I, I, you know, as more and more beans get held into summer, if this market doesn't rally, you would have to assume that that price could come down a little bit more to go forward. Good question. So, but anyway, go back to this chart here. You can see the difference on corn the same way. Uh, USDA's got Brazil at 124 million tons. I think Conab was down around 110 million tons. So some huge divergences here, considering it's harvest down there right now. And so, but a lot of this on the corn crop is going to be on the second corn crop because 75% of the Brazilian corn is grown and it's in the ground right now. And so we'll get more uh, clarification on that, certainly here over the next two, three months. But I think this is pretty fascinating how wide this spread has been here this year between those two 
entities. But if you look at South American production of soybeans right now, and the, the second bar from the right is USDA's numbers. And I mentioned USDA is the high one right now. Uh, they've got Brazil at 155 million tons. They've got Argentina at 50 million tons. And so if you combine those two, it's easily going to be a record bean production, somewhere over 200 million metric tons. The column on the right, an alternative, the green one is the CONAB uh, estimate at 146.5. And in Argentina, the blue one is the Rosario Grain Exchange. They put out an estimate at 49 and a half million tons. So that would take what? Uh, 9 million tons off the top of the crop, but it would still be a record. And so this is part of the reason I think that this bean market, you know, it tries to rally once in a while. We try to see funds cover some shorts, but in the end, we're still looking at a lot of beans coming out of the Southern Hemisphere. And we're planting more acres in the United States this spring. So it's going to be difficult. It's going to be, you know, kind of like sledding uphill on this bean market this year to try to see this bean market rally or really go anywhere. We're going to have to have a strong rally in the bean oil market or uh, a huge weather problem in the United States late in the summer that would be the driver for that. And not going to rule that out at this point, but it, it's it's just not there at the moment. And if you look at the world numbers right now, world ending stocks, according to USDA's report yesterday, stocks to usage, you know, the raw stock number is the highest it's ever been this year. Stocks to usage going up again for the third straight year. So again, nothing real friendly to the bean market right now. And, and that's why the funds have been doing what they've doing. If you look at the net fund position as of, the, you know, this last week, you know, they're still short a hundred and some thousand contracts, almost 150,000 contracts of soybeans. They are up from their record short that they made a couple of months back, but still uh, still holding a very, very large short position. And it's hard to persuade those folks to cover much of that, you know, at a time when things, you know, they've kind of been right on their position uh, here over the last several months. And so, you know, the July chart shows what they've done. They've covered some of that short. In fact, rallied beans a dollar. Uh, from the end of February to the uh, late late part of March. Hopefully we were able to take advantage of some $12 plus prices on the futures market. Again, if you look at the technical indicators at that time, the RSI was up in the low 60s. Stochastics were in the 70s, 80s. So the market was yelling at us to, to take advantage of that here in late July or late uh, March. And hopefully we got that done. Now, where we're at today, even with the markets rally this morning, we're right back up below the nine-day moving average line, this red line at 1187. Uh, that's also real close to the 50% retracement line from the late Feb low to the March high. That 50% retracement's at 1190, and that's right there, the 50-day moving average at 1191. So we've kind of got a cluster of stuff going on right here around that 1190 area. And it wouldn't be a shock to see us go into the weekend right around that 1190 area, you know, right around these, this cluster of lines. Uh, above that, you've got the 20-day the moving average at $12. Uh, as a next goal to the upside, uh, you've got the 100-day moving average that's falling quickly, uh, and it's sitting just about a dime above that recent high. And if the market were able to rally, you know, that 100-day moving average would probably fall in right about that 1240 level. So if I've got old beans in the bin, Probably look, you know, put some offers in up under that 1240 level just in case we pop back there. Uh, or maybe you look at selling and buying an out of the money call option or something like that uh, if this market bumps up. Now, where we sit today, things have turned. The RSI has turned higher. The stochastics crossed this morning higher, which is usually an indication that we're maybe getting ready to get a little run to the upside. So I would be patient at the moment. Probably put some offers in 12 and a quarter, 1230 on July beans. If I've got old crop beans in the bin, we get back up to that area, be a nice opportunity to cash them in. Looking ahead to new crop. Uh, these were a couple of sets of numbers over here on the balance sheet. Number one, uh, this was USDA's set of numbers from its baseline numbers back in February. Updated where I plugged in the new ending stock number into their numbers. The one on the right were my numbers that I had uh, a few weeks, a couple of weeks ago. 
and I plugged in USDA's updated ending stocks for this past year. But I'm using a smaller acreage number than USDA, and I'll still stick with my number, I guess, here for the moment. But you can kind of see a couple of sets of numbers. Most of us expect demand to improve. Part of that is in the crush, uh, part of that in exports this year. And USDA forecasting ending stocks, their number would be at 435 million. Mine would be just under where we're at right now. Call it unchanged from this year. But we're all expecting lower price in beans. Why is that the case? Well, number one, price is already down in the mid-11s. And number two, South American stocks and world stocks continue to grow. And so it's not just a U.S. market anymore. This is a world market that we're looking at. And so what can happen? Well, this was the stocks matrix that I had out before this uh, acreage and stocks report. But I highlighted the prospective plantings number from USDA. Uh, at 86.5 million acres. That's a million below their baseline number. It's a million above where I was at, so somewhere in the middle. And you can kind of see with their, their demand estimate with beginning stocks at 340 million, you know, the green numbers right here show an increase. And so it takes about a 51.1 or two bushel yield this year to increase bean stocks. And that is not a hard thing to do. You know, typically, you know, we last year we were at, uh, well, 49.6, the year before 51.7. Trend line, according to the government's at 52 bushels. So uh, we'll see what happens. But a 51 bushel yield keeps us up in the threes at, at those kind of acreage numbers. So uh, we'll see, you know, again, we'll see what happens with the crop this year. But if we plant 86 and a half million acres, you know, there doesn't seem to be a lot of concern if you grow a trend line crop. And that's why the funds have continued to want to trade this thing from the short side. So what happens this year? Well, if you look at USDA's numbers, plant their acres and use their demand, they would expect the stocks to usage number to get up close to 10% this coming year. And what would that do to prices? And that's what this chart shows, stocks to use compared to average farm price. And you can see that, you know, when we have tight stocks to usage numbers is when we have good prices. But if this stocks to usage number starts working up towards 10%, I would assume prices are going to be working lower. This is a chart I've been showing all winter, just continue to update it as we update prices and as we update uh, the, uh, the stocks numbers. And so November beans, you know, we continue to want to be a seller on the rallies. And again, hindsight's always pretty good, but it does teach us a little bit of something that if you look at this RSI and these stochastics numbers that I include in the heat check, you know, back here in mid late March, we had some great opportunities to be pricing beans above 12 bucks for three or four days. Didn't last very long uh, because the market went back under 12 bucks again. But again, it shows me that you know, we have to be prepared and kind of have to be on your toes when those opportunities hit. Um, that said, November beans up a little bit this morning again. We've got the indicators have turned higher. So maybe we're getting ready for our next little bounce in this market. Uh, we had a dollar run off the low almost, and, and then we've set back about 50, 60 cents. And so can you get above the blue line at 1184? And if so, you know, then that probably opens the door for a run back to that 100-day moving average, the purple line at 1207, uh, which tells me 12 bucks or 1195, something like that, I think would be a great spot to have some offers in to sell November beans. Uh, and if you don't like just openly selling them, you know, maybe you uh, uh, buy an out of the money call if that happens. Maybe you buy your call now if you assume the market's going to continue to run a little higher and then make the sale later. That's a strategy some people look at. And this time of year, you know, and, and I usually talk about seasonals quite a bit, but this is the time of year when the markets tend to trend a little higher uh, as we go now into uh, into May and June. And so, uh, now's the time to be having your selling shoes, uh, at least get them tied and get them ready and and uh, get them on and, and see what happens. Switching over to corn, uh, yesterday USDA did make a couple of bumps in the demand numbers, but it was not as much as expected based on what the grain stocks numbers were at the end of March. Uh, USDA raised feed demand 25 million bushels, took ethanol up 25 million bushels, took ending stocks down 50 million bushels, still above 2.1 billion bushels of corn. Stocks to usage number, 14.5%. Still, you know, similar, not too far below where we were back in 1819. 
Uh, USDA took average farm price down, I believe it was a nickel yesterday to 470. So again, kind of like you mentioned, Rustin, you know, a lot of the crop gets sold early, but you would have to assume that that number is going to probably inch its way down unless the markets were to rally sharply in the near future. Uh, one number that, that they did not change was the export number at 2.1 billion. Uh, there's been some belief that that number might climb a little bit. Uh, based on some of the sales we've had, but USDA didn't feel a reason to do that just yet. I guess I did have this stocks chart. I was looking for it this morning. I put it in here a couple days ago. But if you look at the uh, stocks on farm, off farm, if you look at U.S. Uh, stocks percentage of stocks on the farm right now, we've got a whopping amount of corn, the most we've had since 2005 as a percentage on the farm. We know off farm stocks are up as well. And you can see the breakdown right now and how we compared to last year. Uh, Iowa, Illinois, Nebraska, just to every state across the Corn Belt has got more grain on the farm right now. And, and so that's, uh, again, it's the funds versus the farmer at this point, and that's where, where the market sits. But export inspections uh, have been decent. Uh, you know, we've had a few good weeks in here. We're not records by any means, but Things are bouncing back. Uh, this is the time of year when we typically are making hay in corn shipments now, you know, through the next uh, two to three months. And so this will be important to see shipments continue to climb if we're going to see USDA bump its projection. Now, we're getting a lot of stiff competition out of the Southern Hemisphere as well. You can see that, you know, Brazil had a record corn crop this past year and they shipped the heck out of it from July uh, into the even into the winter. Normally, they're sold out by September, October. This year, they were shipping on into December, which, which interrupted our typical sales season. So this year's corn crop down there is expected to be smaller, which should help us a little bit, but we'll see how much smaller based on weather over the next several months. But world numbers continue to climb. Uh, you know, we're looking at the highest world stock number uh, since 2019. Uh, we're looking at stocks to usage at the world level climbing this year. This is the 23-24 year. So this is the crop we already know about. And so we'll see what happens in 24-25. But right now, there's just no problem, uh, you know, from a supply standpoint. And, and this is what the funds are trading on. This is why they're so short the corn market. And as of last Friday, they're short about 260,000 contracts of corn. Uh which is well off of their record low that they set here back in February. They were down about 350,000. So they bought a lot of corn back and gave us a great opportunity to be making some sales and maybe unloading some of this length that we've had. And if you look at that rally, well, the rally was only about 40 cents. Why was that? Well, because farmers were laying into that rally. You know, I think there was some pretty active farmer selling that kind of kept a lid on this thing when it was coming up. Now, you know, the market was way, way, way oversold in late February when that low was put in place. Finally, things turned around a little bit, but we stopped at 460. Uh, and since then, we're hovering kind of like the beans, kind of down around that 50% uh, retracement. Uh, the moving average lines kind of at the 5 eighths retracement line right here, this upper green line. But you've got the 9-day, the 20-day, the the 50 day, all within two cents of each other, three cents of each other, which is pretty remarkable for this time of the year, which really indicates not a lot of volatility, even though that we've seen some swings, you know, the, the market's been pretty stagnant as far as range goes. Uh, where do you sell? You know, the, right now the RSI, pretty neutral, stochastics trending a little higher. Probably have to look back at this recent high at 460, which is a little below the 100 day moving average at 468 as a first target. And again, I like the, the minimum price type programs for farmers who don't want to miss out. You know, if you've got that FOMO, the fear of missing out, if there's a summer rally, look to make the sale, go buy an out of the money call option. We'll look at some option premiums here in just a couple of minutes. Uh, looking at new crop, uh, the numbers continue to be bearish. Even though USDA is projecting a drop in acres this year, these were their baseline numbers back in February. Uh, their actual number that they came out, their prospective plannings number was a little bit below that. But my number was at 92 million. And, you know, we were all looking at uh, two, four to two, five billion carryover this year, which would be a bearish number. Now, USDA came out at 90.036 million acres in that prospective plannings report, 
way down at the bottom edge of, of trade expectations. But if you throw USDA stock number in along with their demand estimate for this year, it would take about a 177 yield or a little bit above that to keep 2 billion carryover this year. So that's still very possible. Uh, and in fact, their trend numbers, USDA is using 181. FAPRI, the Food and Ag Policy Research Institute, is using 181.4. And so you can see based on those numbers, you know, you could still easily increase corn stocks this year. Uh, the dark green is higher stocks. The light green is above 2 billion. The gray then falls from 2 billion down to a billion five. And so, you know, the odds of staying, you know, green are still, I would say, pretty decent at this point in time. We'll see what happens with yields as we go forward. And what happens, of course, with planted acres. But, you know, go back to the stocks to use numbers that USDA was using in its baseline projections. You know, they're talking about being up 17 plus percent. And that would likely mean lower corn price in the year ahead. And so that's kind of what we've been talking about all winter. Uh, most of the acreage estimates were still above 90 million. I guess spring weather will probably help indicate or help dictate what kind of acres we do see. We have seen in the past years, you know, especially last year, that when we have good crop weather in the spring, we tend to add corn acres. And so we'll see what happens here in the next few weeks. But looking at December corn, again, short term, you've got this huge cluster of moving averages. When the market's sitting right in the middle of it right now from 468 to 471, the indicator's pretty neutral. Uh, the RSI at 49, stochastics in the 40s. So market's pretty flat right now, sitting in the upper half of the recent trading range. Uh, but it's that seasonal time of the year. So I want to have my selling shoes on. We're trading a little bit above the crop insurance base price from back in February. That's always a goal of mine to market better than that. Uh, I think you've got, you know, the recent high at 480, the stochastics uh, at 483, and, or excuse me, the 100-day moving average at 483 and a half. I think that's not a terrible target. The second target, this 200-day moving average, just under five bucks, probably not a bad target. You had a little chart gap back here at 502 that was left on the first day of the year. Not a bad target. So those are some levels that you might want to consider putting some offers in. And again, maybe you look at an option-based strategy. And this was a, a, a thinking cap video I did back at the end of February, marketing in a weak market, but I really focused on utilizing options. And, you know, one of the things that I, I like in an options market are these short dated options, because you don't have to go all the way out to December and buy a December call. I could go ahead and hedge, say, 480 D's corn or 490 D's corn, and instead of going all the way to December, which those options expire in November, you're adding a little extra time value you probably don't need. So in this case, I could say go to a September short dated option on December corn. Why, why do I like that? Well, it, it's still utilizing the December corn futures contract. It's just you're buying two months less time value or three months less time value. This option will expire in 134 days or August the 23rd. And that gets me through the pollination season, uh, gets me into the month of August, into the grain fill season. And so I think that that buys me enough time value that I don't need to buy that extra time value out into the fall. I do have an option built into my crop insurance pro, uh, policy that if the market goes higher, then I get to utilize that instead. So, and that option goes all the way through the month of October when the when the harvest prices are being set. So this gives me something to help me just on my marketing. And so, for example, today, you know, if I were to sell today, I could go out and buy a five dollar call for seventeen cents. Uh, go buy a five fifty call for less than eight cents. So. There's some reasonably priced call options right now. Now, if the market starts trending higher, these call options are going to go up. So consider that. Another strategy you could consider would be a min-max type strategy. Maybe I buy a put and sell a call. Uh, but maybe I, if I did that, I would go all the way out to the December options to do it. But if I looked at this short-dated uh, strategy, a 450 puts about 20 cents right now. Um, I could sell, let's say, a a 520 call for about 12. So the net cost of that trade would be eight cents a bushel. 
gives me a floor at 450 and a ceiling at 520. So the worst case scenario there is that corn goes above 520 and I get shorted out at 520 a bushel, which today I think everybody would bend over backwards to sell corn at 520. But that's the cost of doing that, that type of a strategy in order to put the floor in. So there's a lot of different types of strategies you can look at with options. I'll continue to write about those, especially as the market tries to give us some opportunities, hopefully here over the next several weeks. The last chart I want to show you on corn, again, Susan Stroud put this out, but comparing 2014 to 2024, and I've talked about this all winter long, how there, there seemed to be a lot of rhyming in this chart. You know, we've got a lot of similarities to 2014 this year, uh, the second year after we've started to rebuild stocks. And do we get rid of enough acres and do stocks start, do you increase demand? Um, but you can see where prices have trended. And this is the time of the year over the next month or so where you typically see a rally. But what happened in 2014, once we got the crop in the ground and got off to a pretty good you know, start, the market went down. And so that's what I'm fearful of again this year. And that's why we, uh, let me go back here uh, to this chart right here. You know, this is what happened in 2014. You know, in 13, the average farm price went down, but it went down again in 14. Similar start to, uh, you know, in 23. And we would expect if stocks to usage numbers continue to rise, seeing a similar situation this year. And so that's why, again, why I want to get my selling shoes on over the next month or so, be ready to make some sales. Switching over to wheat. Uh, wheat, uh, USDA made one change, well, a couple little changes, but they, they cut feed demand by 30 million bushels, raised ending stocks 25 million, lowered the farm price a dime, nothing positive out of that wheat report yesterday. Uh, when you look at winter wheat ratings, uh, we're off to a pretty good start. 56% uh, of the crop right now rated good to excellent, uh, much better than we've seen the last couple of years. Uh, but there's some concern going forward weather-wise, and we'll look at weather here in just a few minutes. But right now, at least the numbers don't point to anything positive. When you look at the world stocks to use uh, numbers, U.S. stocks to use numbers, we're expecting a rise again this year. World numbers kind of flat. Uh, we're seeing uh, crop conditions in Europe not so great right now, or a little bit lower than last year. So something to watch there. But Boy, the former Soviet Union has continued to kick butt the last couple of years. And, and that's really been the problem that the wheat market has had. When you look at Russian wheat exports, now you can make the argument here that some of these wheat bushels may have been Ukrainian bushels prior and maybe Russia's, you know, latched onto that ground or whatever the case is. But, but make no bones about it, they've been exporting a heck out of wheat. And so that's been the problem that the wheat market has had in the Western Hemisphere, just that added competition from the Russians. And so looking ahead to next year, these are USDA's baseline numbers. I plugged in the little bit higher beginning stock number, and that would take ending stocks next year to 819 million bushels and likely continue to weigh on price. They're saying $6 is an average farm price in the year ahead. And so that's A, going to weigh on, on, of course, wheat price. B, going to weigh on corn price. And so that's something a lot of corn producers don't think about. But this, this struggling wheat market certainly has had something, had some pull downward on the corn market as well. Uh, should note out, uh, you go back to four years ago when we had similar wheat stocks at 845 million bushels, stocks to usage number was almost identical. You had wheat price a buck less at that point in time. So we were coming off of low prices at that point in time. And in fact, the market had come up a little bit, but it does tell you that, you know, that with those stocks to usage numbers, that tends to be negative to the market. And so if you look at the funds, funds are short about 90,000 contracts, a soft red winter wheat right now. Uh, it's the most on that particular date. It's not a record, but it is a significant short position. And you can see what it's done to the market. That fund selling has certainly taken us down. We're about a dollar below the crop insurance price from last fall. And so depending on your coverage levels, you know, you could be looking at some potential payments this year, depending on your coverage. And of course, depending on what the yields end up looking like, but trend is lower at the moment. Uh, even this morning, uh, you know, the market's ticked up. We're sitting right around the 20 day moving average at the moment. Uh, you've got the other moving average lines at 572. You had a recent high at just under 590. Uh, but the RSI and stochastics neutral, but pointing lower at the moment. So 
hopefully, you know, this market can find some support here and maybe give us a little bit of a bump. Uh, the 100 day moving average now is under $6 a bushel. And uh, so I, I think that would be a good target. Now, of course, the 200 day moving average at 634 might be a second target. You might want to be able to consider making some sales, especially with wheat harvest only a couple of months away. Looking at hard red winter wheat, uh, funds short about 40,000 contracts, which is the most they've been short on this time of the year. Kansas City chart, uh, you know, we're sticking right on top of all these moving average lines within three cents of each other. Recent high, just over 595. Indicators all pretty neutral, but pointing down uh, here this morning. Uh, right now, I'm probably letting my insurance policy do some of the marketing for me, depending on my coverage level, but we're a buck and a half or buck 60 below uh, where that price was set at. So I don't think I want to be a seller today, get back above six bucks, probably want to start looking at trickling out some sales. Maybe you look back at the, the January high at 636, look at the 200-day uh, moving average at 670 as some targets there. And then finally, spring wheat. Again, the market, uh, the funds shortest they've been on this particular date. Uh, not quite a record. They were there just a couple of months back. And boy, this market has just been a uh, just a steady, steady slide and no, no other way to say it. And the 50 day moving average, this gold line has continued to be a lid on this market. And so can you get back above that? Well, we tapped it here yes, uh, two days ago, and now we've turned back lower again. So maybe some of this run in commodities uh, here today will, will leak into this Minneapolis wheat market. You know, of course, the Russian export demand uh, shipments have been biggest reason I think it's been seeing weakness here uh, in the spring wheat market. And you look at September new crop wheat, again, the indicators have turned lower here yesterday, which was not a good sign, uh, but margin protection insurance, anybody that bought that feels pretty good about it. It's about a buck and a half in the market right now, uh, depending on your coverage level, and of course, depending on county yields. Uh, even the other base price policies look pretty good at the moment. So that 50-day moving average is the key here as we go forward. Lastly, cotton. Uh, USDA made no changes to cotton balance sheet yesterday, kept ending stocks at a relatively snug 2.5 million bales. Uh, they did lower the average farm price a penny to 76 cents. Uh, we look at the world's uh, world numbers. Uh, we're continuing to climb a little bit at the world level. And so even though U.S. stocks are pretty snug, uh, world ending stocks, uh, yeah, you know, still remain a little bit on the bearish side. Stocks to usage, close to 50 percent right now. So we've got a lot of cotton stocks right now available around the world. And, and one of the problems, and I've showed this chart over the winter, but the inflation numbers in China and China's actually had multiple months of deflation. And so you can see here at the end of the year, October, November, December, January, all big deflationary periods. Now they're starting to see maybe a little bit of an uptick. And so we're going to watch the Chinese economy pretty close, I think, to get an indication of what can happen in this cotton market. But, you know, without a kickstart to their economy, you know, they just are in a very stagnant position right now. And so unlike the United States, where we're kind of fighting inflation, China's just been on the other side of it right at the moment. And so this is something we need to happen, need to see some growth there. But what's really been, uh, I think, a bearish factor for the cotton market has been the funds. You know, funds built such a large, long position on that rally that they were due for a correction. And now they've started to liquidate some of it. And now, all of a sudden, now you've seen problems with the U.S. stock market, you know, some concerns about the U.S. economy, uh, inflation at home, deflation in China. Uh, it's just not been a good situation. And a year or a month ago, I'm sorry, I had this picture that I shared uh, at the beginning of my cotton segment. And, every, you know, people, the cotton market was all of a sudden really, really cool a month ago. Uh, that's not the case right now. And you can see what's happened. We've taken July cotton from a buck two, uh, 17 cents off down to 85 cents here this morning, uh, below the 200 day moving average. Uh, boy, life comes at you fast, I guess, is what Ferris Bueller said. And, you know, we've in less than two months, we've uh, we've taken what uh, almost 20 percent off the cotton market. Uh, cotton is well into the not zone. RSI at 31 percent. Uh, the stochastics in single digits tells me this market's way oversold right now. 
we're just looking for somebody to buy it. And with the funds still long, it's going to be a difficult situation. So again, hindsight's pretty good, but you look at the, the amount of time that we spent with the RSI and the stochastics well up into the hot zone, uh, you know, all the way from 90 cents to a buck. And, you know, now here we are on the other side of it. So what's this going to do to acres going forward? I think that's a question. Uh, you know, a lot of people were talking 11 million acres of cotton. Some people were talking more potentially. Uh, it might put the brakes on that a little bit. Now, what could add a few acres in the Delta might be prevented plant on corn if it stays wet down in Mississippi, Louisiana. Um, as we get into Texas, you know, what's going to happen to wheat acres? Uh, you know, what's going to happen to cotton down there? I, I still think that there's a lot of question marks on this cotton thing. But if you plug in 11 million acres, if you plug in a trend yield, you know, you're looking at a, you know, a little over 3 million carry out. So not huge. And, and so, but everybody's a little optimistic that demand's going to continue to grow. And so I think that that's going to be the story in the cotton market is the demand. <clears throat> and that's driven by, of course, inflation in the United States, deflation, you know, China, is that going to turn around, et cetera, et cetera. So looking at the new crop uh, market, you know, we had our base price set at 83 cents. We were feeling pretty good about things at that time. Now we're trading down around 80 cents. So all of a sudden, you know, the stacks policy kind of comes into play. Uh, where we start to at least talk about price drop, but RSI at 28 stochastics would indicate this market again, and in well into the not zone. Uh, we've broken below the 200 day moving average. In fact, we're sitting right on it here this morning. And I think that's key as we go into the weekend. Otherwise, you've got this little trend line that we started back in November, kind of started to ignore that. But now it's kind of coming back into play a little below 80 cents. So we'll watch that going forward. I don't want to be a seller anytime in these, these areas. You get back up that 85 cent range or above the insurance price. We'll talk about it then. I think a min max strategy still makes sense to me. We talked about that a month or two ago. I still think that type of strategy makes sense this early in cotton. So switching gears to U.S. spring and summer weather. And, you know, now's the time where we start to update that every day. If you check out my daily email, I'll include most days uh, the latest forecast uh, email from Empire Weather. Uh, Nutrient Ag also puts out some pretty good videos as well. Empire does also. And so we'll try to include something every day on the weather. But the latest drop monitor out yesterday morning did show just a slight improvement in corn country. I think 23% of the corn growing area in the United States now under drought, which was down a point from last week. But what's interesting to me, you start looking back at some of these change maps and these change maps are, uh, are really good to look at because they show where the development is and where the disappearance is. And, you know, if you look over the last month, you've had a big improvement through the Corn Belt. You've also had this Southern Plains region where you've started to see some increase in drought. Uh, if you look over the last 13 weeks or the last quarter year, kind of shows you something similar, but it also shows you how wet the Southern Mississippi uh, basin has been, the Ohio basin or the Tennessee Valley. Uh, you know, we've had significant, huge rains in this part of the world, and that might be a prevent plant concern uh, here over the next few weeks. But again, the area to pay attention to, the panhandle of Oklahoma, Kansas, panhandle of Texas, the upper Midwest as well, and the wheat country. So that'll be an area that the wheat market might begin to start to watch. But one thing that's very positive has been the development in Iowa, Minnesota, you know, that we've had some significant improvement over the last uh, several weeks. But we're really watching this uh, La Nina development and watching the ENSO probabilities. And uh, I think I read yesterday the number, they said 85% odds of, of La Nina arriving by July, I think it was, or something like that. So but you can see the odds on here, I guess, or August, September, 80%. This is uh, just issued uh, here over the last 24 hours. El Nino is disappearing. You know, as you go into May, June, July, neutral is, is the, the, the highest percentage, but July, August, September, or J June, July, August, July, August, September, you really see what is anticipated to be the rival of La Nina. What happens? Well, we'll look at that here in a minute, but short term, uh, we continue to see what looks like some maybe beneficial rainfall in the upper Midwest. It's going to slow down planting progress, but at least it'll add some subsoil moisture. 
continue to see rains in Arkansas, maybe beneficial up in the Ohio Valley, but you also see this big white spot here uh, in the Southern Plains, which is uh, detrimental to, to crop growth and development down there. Uh, the week two forecast changes. Uh, wet across the south, dry across the north. So the north is going to get a shot of rain, it looks like, over the next seven days, then maybe dry up a little bit, give you maybe late April, starting to see some good planting windows up there. Uh, hopefully for the folks in the southern plains, this moisture stays to the west and, and you get a good soaking out there. But this area down in the delta looks like it's going to continue to be very wet, which is probably not wanted here at the present time. Week two, as you go out two weeks from now, what's the soil moisture going to look like? Well, they're continuing to show on the drier side here throughout the central part of the country. And so we'll see what happens as we go forward. But as you start looking out at those longer term forecasts into the summer, uh, everybody that I read, but the CFS model in particular, above normal temperatures all the way through November. Uh, and I think that that's been the way for the last couple of years. I don't even know what normal is anymore. Maybe above normal is the new normal, but uh, they're showing above normal, at least on the maps, or at least dark, you know, bright orange colors. So uh, we'll see. I see some people starting to use more significant colors in their uh, maps these days, which, you know, we'll see. But the moisture is probably the biggest thing. And as you look at the change, April, May, June, you know, that's kind of what we're talking about right now. Wet in the south, maybe starting to dry a little bit in the Midwest. But we're really watching this development down into Mexico and seeing how it moves up into the southern plains. In May, June, July, you know, you start pushing that up into New Mexico. The rest of the country, not in bad shape. July, June, July, August, you see more dry conditions pushing up into the middle of the country. July, August, September is when we really start to see the expansion and the impact of La Nina. So right now, I would say it's about, uh, you know, uh, getting the pump ready. Uh, you know, hopefully these rains that we get right now soak up and, and uh, build the subsoil up because as you get out into late summer, you know, you start seeing some dry forecasts. Uh, maybe that uh, is your late summer bean rally. Uh, maybe that's the reason that I mark it with a minimum price contract where if I make sales on these rallies, I'm looking at buying out of the money options that keep me in the market just in case this market continues to, uh, to trend a little higher as we get into late summer. So just, I don't, you know, that way I don't miss out. But with options pretty cheap right at the moment, not a bad strategy to look at. Uh, looking at the NOAA models for the same periods on precipitation, not quite as uh, as much orange and red on the screen, uh, but you look at April, May, June, you know, you see a lot of precipitation, uh, but May, June, July, you start to see that development of below normal precip moving up into the Southern Plains, June, July, August, pretty much up the Western part of the Plains, and then June, Jul or July, August, September, maybe not as aggressive moving the below normal East uh, in their forecast is what you saw on the CFS model back there. So again, a lot of differing uh, opinions on when La Nina is going to arrive, but I think most in agreement that it will at some point. Oh, and then the Euro model, similar, uh, but you can see how different weather models look different. You know, we've got April, May, June at the top, May, June, July, July, uh, June, July, August, bottom left, which actually still keeps above normal precip through the Corn Belt, you know, through the big chunk of the Corn Belt uh, throughout that that. June, July, August uh, map. July, August, September keeps the Great Lakes above normal. So uh, so again, each map's a little different. We're going to continue to monitor these, certainly. And the market will, too, as we go forward and see if the funds have a reason to want to lift their short positions. Uh, the last topic I want to talk about today is margin protection insurance, as well as ECO. Uh, and I could throw in SCO there as well, uh, because for a couple of reasons, uh, First off, before I do that, I do want to tell you something that's changed. And if you go into the resources tab right now, you'll see a, a drop down that says indemnity and profitability worksheets. And if I click on that, this is what the screen looks like. We have housed now all of these worksheets that we've got, indemnity and profitability worksheets, all under that, that drop down. So we've got a revenue loss trigger yield worksheet. We've got our SCO, ECO indemnity worksheet. We've got a worksheet for stacks, margin protection, the profitability matrix, which I showed this winter. 
So we've got all of these housed in one spot. And as we continue to add any uh, sheets to this, we'll continue to house them out here. So I would encourage agents on the call, check that out. Farmers on the call, talk to your agent, have them pull that up for you. But I know a lot of people are concerned or, 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 or curious as to see what payments might look like for 2023 crop. Those payments, let me go ahead. RMA says that they will release final 2023 county yields no later than June 14th. Uh, the production reporting deadline is the end of this month. So by the end of April, you have to have your production turned in. At that point, the RMA takes that data, compiles it, and then they'll put out a, the county final county yields. Those numbers have to be out no later than June 14th. Usually they put them out on June 14th. But what we do know for corn, for example, FarmDoc put this map out recently. Now this was based on the NAS yields, but the NAS yields that came back out in February, uh, the orange is basically below trend and green is above trend. And so I, I think anybody in these orange counties is very likely to get a payment for either ECO or, or margin protection last year. Even some of the light green counties might be looking at triggering some payments because of the significant drop we had in price this year. And so I went ahead and put in some examples uh, using the NASH yields. Now keep in mind that these NAS numbers are not what we use, but if I plug in the NAS number just to get an idea, this would be in Lynn County, uh, Iowa. And Lynn County was one of these, I think it was in the orange right here in East Central Iowa. And if we plugged in the NASH yield into the margin protection work, indemnity worksheet, Lynn County was expecting a 206.6 yield this year, ended up at 179 and a half. You can see what the costs did over here as well as the corn price. Price went on corn from 611 for margin protection down to 488. Input prices went down overall. So overall inputs, expected costs were 482, final costs were 403.62. So that really uh, negatively impacted the policy this past year. However, because it was 95% coverage and because of the 1.2 protection factor, because of this huge drop in price, we were looking at potentially a payment indemnity of almost $300 an acre given these set of numbers. And you can see down below that number can vary depending on what the final county yield is. And so I didn't even take any of the county yields down that far to where this 179 was. Even at a 188, you know, Lynn County would be looking at an indemnity around 242. So we're looking at, you know, in all those orange ones, you're looking at some substantial uh, payments with margin protection insurance. If I go to Sangamon County, Illinois, Sangamon County, just was in the light, light green. Actually, their NASH yield was about a bushel, 1.4 bushel higher than the expected county yield. But if I plug in into the, into the matrix or into the worksheet, all of my input costs, we're looking at a payment of $134 an acre. And you can see how that would vary depending upon what this yield does. At 221, whatever, you know, if we drop down a percent, you know, now you're down, now you're at 155. So that's why this RMA yield is going to be, you know, it's going to be a big deal knowing what that number is when it comes out here within the next couple of months. Went ahead up to Allen County, Indiana. And the reason I picked Allen County, it's a little shade of darker green on that map that, that Farm Doc had out. Allen County actually had a county yield, according to NAS, six bushel higher than the expected county yield. So even with input costs down, Allen County still looking at an indemnity of nearly $84 an acre using that NASH yield. And you can see in the matrix down below, depending on what happens with that final yield up or down, that's going to impact that, that number. And so even, so go, go back to that map again, you know, even if you're in a green county on here, don't rule out the possibility of getting an indemnity payment because of the 95% coverage this year. Also, ECO. <coughs> Let's look at an ECO policy. And this is Allen County once again. Uh, this is our ECO indemnity worksheet. And so if a producer added ECO this past year, now one thing ECO did not have was as high a price. The base price on ECO was 591 instead of 611. However, 
ECO was not impacted by the drop in the input prices, whereas margin protection was. And so that band of coverage with ECO, keep in mind ECO is based on a band of 9%, 95 to 86, that band is worth $98. And even with a rise to the NAS number at 190.4, you know, you would be collecting that entire 9% band of coverage that, uh, that you bought this year. And so that's, again, why even in those green counties don't rule out the possibility of potentially seeing an indemnity payment. So, and the matrix will show you where the payments would be and how we know different yields, different prices, et cetera. So we know the price is locked in now. Now we're just mainly, look, you know, 488 was the harvest price down here at $98. You know, uh, right now it looks like you're going to collect that entire band no matter what happens. So a little bit different. Margin protection doesn't have a downside. Your downside on it is basically where your revenue coverage kicks in from that policy. ECO does have a, sep a split right at that 9% band. So talk to your agent if you're curious to find out what your policy may be looking at for you for this year. Uh, for 2024 crop, anybody that bought margin protection, right, protection this year, those policies are now starting to set the harvest price or the final prices for their inputs. And so if you want to know what those are every day, go to my email that you get, click on this link right here, 2024 margin protection harvest, and it's going to bring up this table. It's going to show you where those prices are being set at. And we're not quite halfway through the month of April yet, but you can see where the prices are. Urea average price right now at 295 a ton, down about 16%. DAP is running 5% higher than what the, the base price was. Uh, diesel's running a percent lower. Interest rates don't set their averages until October, but it's running about 3% higher. Prices of the crops, when I plugged these in yesterday, were running lower across the board. And so I can plug those numbers into this matrix for 2024. And here's what the matrix looks like. And if I assume an unchanged county yield this year, in any county, you know, you're looking at some payment for margin protection with where the market is right now, because we're down more than 5%, plus inputs haven't changed a whole lot. About a $10 drop right now is what we're figuring. But you can see down in the matrix, you know, at 100% of expected county yield, 468 below, you know, if we were to go to 407 this fall, you're looking at a buck at $190 indemnity payment at an unchanged yield. So, we got a long, long way to go on this policy, but the policy can show you how this policy, how it's working for the producer here as we go forward. So that's why we put this matrix together with soybeans. Uh, you look at the beans right now, the one big thing that stands out in beans, actually input prices for beans have gone up slightly because A, you don't have urea into that calculation. You just have DAP, diesel, and interest, really, that's it. But the bean price has gone down a buck thirty. And so because of the big drop in price, you know, you're looking at potentially an indemnity today if we had an unchanged county yield of around, you know, 40 some dollars an acre. And so that's why I encourage anybody that that if you bought margin protection, you want to know more about margin protection, how the policy is working. You just plug in these inputs. We can get them on the margin site and voila, it's going to it's going to show you these numbers. And after we get the input prices set. Uh, we'll go to the to the version that's out on our uh, out on the uh, agent portal. We'll uh, update those input prices so you don't have to go get them, and then you those will be in there uh, to where you can run your calculations. Then, so hope that uh, shares some of the uh, information there that you can use. Uh, what's coming up as we go forward? May tenth, big day. Uh, we will get the next WASDA report, which will include USDA's first look at a balance sheet for next year. Uh, so that's a big deal. Uh, I'll be kind of curious to see with their acreage numbers, what they're if they're making any changes to demand, what it would look like. Uh, May 13th, we'll have our next aftermath. That's on a Monday. So we'll talk all about that report and much more. Conab comes out on the 14th with their report next month. The 27th, the market will be closed for Memorial Day. Um, June 12th is our next WASDA report. June 13th, we'll have our aftermath. So in between now and then, we've got acreage reporting, or excuse me, production reporting deadline here at the end of April. Uh, I mentioned by June 14th, uh, RMA has will release its final county numbers for last year. So there'll be significant things happen between now and then. Plus, 
the development of potentially La Nina and, and a look at how that's working as well. So thank you for joining me. Uh, might have one more question. Nope, just to thank you. You guys are very welcome. Take care. Hope you have a good month ahead. Have a great planning season. And we'll visit with you again real soon.